Thanks for everyone, uh, to everyone for joining us for the ASEG New South Wales October meeting. Um, we have an exciting presentation today given by Derek Palmer from UNSW. Is there a seismic refraction signature for sulfide mineralization? Um, before we start, we just have a few housekeeping slides to go through. So the ASEG acknowledges the, the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today and the many lands on which we undertake our work. We recognize their continuing connection to these lands, water and culture and pay respect to their elders past and present. Uh, thank you to our corporate members, which are shown in this slide here and to our branch sponsors. Um, in July, we had Fender, we had a joint um, SMEG and ASEG meeting where Fender sponsored and in August, the company that I work for, Bridgeport sponsored. Um, we're always looking for sponsors. So if you know anyone or are in a position to help the New South Wales branch out, talk to me or Barbic or anyone else on the um, committee. So for our online audience, if you have a question, use the Q&A function as highlighted here. Uh, type your question in the box and then the moderator will see it. Uh, so tomorrow we have another webinar on um, predictive isotropic rock physics, a predictive and isotropic rock physics model of shale and its practical applications. And then closer to home, in New South Wales, we have the student night and Ken from Condor Consulting presenting on the 16th of November. And on the 7th of December, we have dinner at the Fortune of War and Barbie and I will send out the details, hopefully within the next week or so. <coughs> um, if you're not already a member, please become one. All the benefits are listed there and plus your cost will be subsidized for the dinner. Keep in touch. Um, there's the website and all the social medias. And now we have a, bit of, a little bit of news from our New South Wales branch. Um, so SMEDGE, the Sydney Mineral Exploration Discussion Group, held its 50th anniversary dinner at the Kirribilli Club on the 25th of August. After a break of three years due to the COVID restrictions, 200 geoscientists gathered to recognize the appointment of four new life members of SMEDGE. One of those awardees is a member of the ASEG, namely Mike Smith, and he joined Steve Collins as the second member to receive this honor. Mike Smith was awarded the SMEDGE life membership for his huge contribution to geoscience society development while also undertaking extensive mineral exploration management work in Australia, Europe, Southwest Pacific, Japan, Bolivia, and other locations. His volunteer roles include ASIC president, AIG president, AGC president, chairman, um, and FASTS treasurer, along with lengthy terms on each of those federal executive committees. 18 years running the AIG Registration Board, election to the GSA Governing Council, service on the 34th International Geological Congress Organising Committee, and on many National Geoscience Conference Committees. Currently, he serves as the Chairman of the AIG Awards Committee, is the Deputy Chairman of the National Rock Garden Trust, and is Chair of the New South Wales Rock Selection Committee. The other two, 2020 life membership recipients are Dr. Richard Silito. Oh, sorry. Hmm? Uh, Dr. Richard Silito, Silito. Oh, Silito, an international geological consultant who resides in London. Dr. Jane Barron, um, eminent consulting petrologist and New South Wales diamond expert and company entrepreneur and geoscience mentor, Kim Stanton Cook. Um, full citations are available on the SMEDGE website. The new life members received an engraved medal and frame certificate. So let's thank Mike again for all the work he's done. Alrighty, so now on to Derek's presentation, um, a brief biography. Derek Palmer obtained a BSc in 1967 and an MSc in 1976 from the University of Sydney 
and a PhD in 2001 and a DSC in 2014 from the University of New South Wales. He started his career at the Geological Survey of New South Wales and finished it at the University of New South Wales. He received the Graham Sands Award from the AESEG in 1992, the Reginald Fessenden Award from the SEG in 1995, the Larrick um, Hawkins Award from the from UNSW in 2001, and the Ludger Mintrop Award from the EAGE in 2016 for his contributions to near service refraction seismology. His current research interests are focused, focused on the application of full waveform refraction imaging and inversion to the regolith. So now we'll invite Derek to start his presentation. Pointer options. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Steph, and thank you, colleagues. Uh, I've been playing with refraction techniques for many, many decades. And uh, if I can just get, get this right. Uh, And yeah, I, uh, I, I retired from UNSW as an early career researcher in 2005. Uh, that's a couple of years after my PhD. The university's got a policy that for the first five years after your PhD, you are categorized as an early career researcher. So I felt as though that although I accepted the timing, uh, I was in the beginnings of my career and I have to continue with the work that I had uh, started with the PhD. The, the major theme of my work has been full trace processing with seismic refraction data with seismic units. Uh, and uh, it's led me down quite a few um, rabbit holes in, in the last two, uh, two decades. What I've been looking at is detailed model building, both on travel times and with amplitudes. I've come to the uh, conclusion, the realization that perhaps it's inevitable that the refraction techniques will move on to a full waveform elastic inversion. It's inevitable. That's the, re that's the way that um, reflection seismology has gone. And it's what I anticipate happening with the brain. In the last two decades, uh, there's been dramatic uh, increases in data volumes. So a large part of my work has been how to handle the colossal volumes that are uh, characteristic of uh, routine reflection uh, uh, acquisition. Most of the people in the audience would associate refraction with the geotechnical applications, which tends to be, I believe, a bit of a cottage industry. So we're looking at smaller volumes uh, and uh, not much being done with the data. So a lot of my research has been trying to fit refraction processing into a framework that's very similar to reflection processing so that we can get more out of the data uh, and um, uh, make it more efficient fundamentally. All of my uh, work has been focused on two, I guess, basic concepts of improving resolution and improving signal noise ratios. The uh, improving resolutions we think is pretty straightforward, but I found that uh, the basic uh, seismic reflection processing, such as DECON, has had a dramatic impact on some of my refraction work. But more importantly, I believe the major problem with refraction is the fact that the, uh, the amplitudes are so low. Signal noise ratios is a fundamental problem. And whereas 
I would suggest that the common midpoint stack has been the foundation of the dramatic, uh, spectacular advances in reflection seismology in the last 50 years. Uh, there's nothing comparable with refraction. And as such, uh, it is, I think it's time to get over that, uh, that hurdle. Now, the presentation I'll give, I'll give you, I'll break it up into four, four components. The first one is looking at amplitudes. Second one is looking at model building. Third, one, third part is um, uh, mineral systems. And the fourth is uh, full waveform imaging. And I'll pull it together in the end to uh, outline what I think is a, a viable strategy for uh, exploration of the regolith and in particular to mineral exploration. I've got 60 odd overheads of slides here, and uh, I guess I'll take about an hour, give or take, right? Possibly give a bit more. <laughs> I'm look, I've been looking at uh, the data recorded by, by Geoscience Australia, uh, mainly because it's available. Uh, petroleum data is a bit hard to get because uh, they have all the confidentiality issues. But the hard rock data shot by Geoscience Australia is actually more interesting. There's more things happening and as such, uh, it's more challenging. The data is recorded, uh, I'm looking at the Lachlan data, which was recorded in 1999. It was shot with the uh, 240 channel ARAM24 system. And uh, they had uh, uh, three 30 ton Hemi vibrators, etc. Now I'm looking at two sets of data with the uh, with the Lachlan survey. The first was the regional data, which is recorded with 240 channels split spreads, with uh, 40 meter uh, groups and 40 meter arrays, and they shot part of one of those lines, line one, with 10 meter the source and receiver interval. So it's a point source, point receiver thing. And that's, that's what we all termed the Warinia survey because it was near uh, a couple of wheat silos and railway line called Warinia. The area that I'm looking at is, uh, this is the, uh, the Forbes quarter million sheet area. Uh, the top part is, and the bottom part is the top part of the Kudamundra sheet. Um, you can see I've messed up with the labeling, but it's one and a half degrees by one degree, which is roughly 150 kilometers by 100 kilometers. Line one is this sort line through here, and I'm looking at the little two uh, kilometer section here at the end of line one, which includes uh, some of uh, the Ordovician turbidites and a bit of Devonian uh, sediments. And there's a map thrust going through it. The other end, where I was also looking at the 40 metre data, uh, covers the Ordovician volcanics uh, and the mast and thrust. The mast and thrust is a major feature. It runs from a map here, it runs up into the narrow mine sheet. So it's about 100 kilometres long. So it's a major structural feature. Uh, Ollie Raymond and his team at um, uh, GA produce this map of the uh, depth to fresh bedrock from water bores. There's several hundred, maybe thousands of water bores. The top, tr uh, top blue line through here is the current uh, trace of the Lachlan River. Uh, it's probably a bit wider than that right now with the current flooding. Uh, Forbes is in about here. The Warinia uh, segment I'm looking at is down the bottom here, and there's roughly 60 odd meters of, um, of cover over bedrock. The other end I'm looking at is uh, here, it's on Bland Creek. Uh, Bland Creek is about, uh, this end of it here is about 150 meters of depth of bedrock. Uh, lake Cowell is up here, that's an ephemeral lake. And evolution mining have a big hole in the ground uh, around about here. Uh, they're currently digging out uh, 300,000 ounces of gold a year. 
which looks like something like half a billion dollars of revenue. So it's a fairly, fairly profitable operation. <coughs> right now, I guess the guys at Evolution Mining are bailing out the pit, okay, because the area is probably a bit damp at this time. Couple of shots of the acquisition. Uh, the vibrators, the two Hemi uh, uh, IBI 60s, uh, they were adjacent in this setup, uh, but for the 40 meter, they would have three in line and they take a sweep, move up, take a sweep, move up, and so forth. Uh, the 40 meter groups for the 40 meter data often was stretched out, but for the uh, 10 meter arena survey, the bunched up and planted as such. So, uh, there's long-standing concerns, right? Uh, unrealistic concerns about planting. If there's any concerns, this sort of obviated that. This is a minor diversion, um, but if I had my time over uh, and I was involved, I would have liked to have seen the vibrators in line rather than side to side. The vibrators put out nominally P-wave signal but you can see that there's an enormous amount of shear wave energy that we're not using. Uh, and this makes you know, a fair bit of converted wave signal. And my belief is that uh, if we could get them together somehow rather, and get a bit of shear wave energy in the vertical direction, which would be of use for refraction surveys, then we could uh, make something of it. But my belief is that eventually we're going to be looking at full waveform elastic inversion and that will require uh, some, some measure of this uh, the converted wave signal and that in turn means shear wave static. So to me uh, the shear waves are uh, a major consideration. It's a typical shot record, 240 trace split spread. It's typical. Um, the, uh, the stuff has been gained so that the RMS uh, amplitude is the same zone and it, um, it amplifies the power traces. The forward traces on the right have better signals noise ratio than the, tra the reverse traces on the left. I don't know why. The, the, whole, the whole survey is characterized by that. And if someone knows, I would like to know why reverse traces don't look so hot. There's a reasonable amount of traffic noise. This is typical. I mean, there's a lot of shot records that look worse than that, that have a heap of um, traffic noise, both from the field crew and uh, uh, local people moving around. And there's the occasional shot record that has no traffic noise. I've measured the amplitudes and post breaks and so forth uh, with uh, some of the uh, Scythic Unix software. Uh, and to process the amplitudes, I've simply taken logs. Okay, it's uh, the, the amplitudes for each segment, the rate path are multiplied to linearize the problem as we do with all of our geophysics. Uh, I've taken logs and um, I've done two things. For the next couple of slides, I've averaged the forward and reverse amplitudes, uh, take out the effect of dip, which we'll talk about later. But the point I want to bring out with the next couple of slides is that there's a huge variation in amplitude. There's something like 80 dB between the near and the far traces. Um, but correcting for the geometrical spreading uh, jacks up the noise as well as the signal. And I've got a dead trace, which uh, the significance of which will become apparent very shortly. So the image on the left is uh, the vertical scale is the amplitude in dB, goes from minus 12 dB to 96 dB. The horizontal scale is the station number, it goes from 1450 to 1650. 200 stations, station spacing is 10 meters, 200 times 10 gives two kilometers, okay? For the traces close to the shock, okay, that's the 
the, the purple uh, magenta colour. Uh, amplitudes up around 84 dB. For the offset traces, 120 trace, and, uh, trace offset, and that is 120 times 10, 1.2 kilometres, uh, the amplitude is way down. So quite a dramatic change in amplitude across the spread. Now, we're trying to find ways to summarise uh, conveniently all the information of these, of this, um, uh, these traces. Okay, so in this case, I've got 24,000 traces. Now, for me, that's a reasonable number of traces. But for any geotech, I mean, it's, it's, it's way above uh, the sort of data volumes that they would handle. Note that the amplitudes on the left are higher than the amplitudes on the right. Now, I flicked it round to the middle trace, at uh, the middle uh, uh, image, where I put the offset in the vertical scale uh, from zero close to the source to 120 traces, far offsets. And again, we can see the, uh, the amplitude scale goes from zero for the magenta to red for, uh, for 84 dB. We can see that, again, it's emphasizing the huge variation in amplitude. That's the dead trace here at 1577, I think, and it pops up like so. Uh, again, amplitudes on the left, higher than amplitudes on the right. These dipping events are source generated. So I've gone from a receiver gather to a shock gather. And we can see that the dead trace pops up at this, uh, this V effect and the uh, shock shot location effects pot up in the vertical direction. So it provides a nice way to summarize the amplitude variation and to see where the sources of noise etc. come from. And the obvious thing to do is to amplify it, okay? Correct for offset. Uh, and uh, I've tried everything. I've tried linear with distance, cubic with distance, uh, and everything in between, I've tried the exact thing. All it does is just shift the baseline up or down, but it's the same general, uh, same general feature. This obviously is a shock gather because my dead trace plots up as this V effect. Uh, and I've got the very high amplitudes for the direct arrivals through here. The, in, the, in the processing I'll show uh, in the next couple of slides, that's not a big drama, but when I've done the inversion, I've taken out the effect of the uh, direct arrivals. Again, amplitudes on the left are higher than those on the right. So, what do you do? With all this data, you've got to do something, okay? So, I've done histograms on common receiver gathers. So, uh, they've been corrected, and um, I've got uh, forward traces, average, and reverse traces. And we can see that um, my labeling is every 12 dB, and the variation is about 6 dB. Uh, I've stacked it on, uh, I've done the uh, uh, histogram on 3 dB bins. And 3 dB is roughly my standard deviation. Um, and we can see that from here, 120 dB, to over here is about 108 dB. There's roughly 12 dB of um, dynamic of, of variation. The 12 dB is a factor of four. So there's significant variation. Uh, it's interesting too, that with the high noise, I'm still able to get a reasonable estimate of the, um, of the head wave coefficient. In the sources too, the source gather. And uh, the vertical stripe, so that's, uh, that's forward, average, reverse. And the vertical striations are related to the fact that so in this part of the uh, survey, the Wurundja survey, the shots are every two stations, or the, the sweeps are every two stations. A couple of places like um, this place here in the middle, I've got uh, a couple of uh, VPs are missing. So it comes up as a much bigger gap. What I also have is this horizontal banding of every 3 dB. 
I don't know what it is. Right? I'm up for suggestion. Uh, I thought maybe it's an aliasing problem, but whatever, uh, there it is, for all it's worth. Do a comparison. Uh, receiver gathers on the, uh, main receiver gathers on the left, shot gathers on the right, and they look pretty similar. Uh, now I've come at this uh, from a more circuitous route uh, uh, three or four years ago, but uh, you're trying to present this, I've, I've actually found that this is a much simpler approach. And we can see that, uh, surprise, surprise, the forward, uh, the, uh, the shot and receiver head wave coefficients are pretty similar. Okay, so let me summarize this. Head wave amplitudes exhibit a huge variation in amplitude, okay? 80 odd dB or more. However, the geometric uh, corrections for, for the geometric spreading are quite adequate. Now, the theoretical uh, correction is given by this formula here. This is derived, I think, by Harold Jeffries, probably Kenyard, Helen, uh, Peter O'Brien, um, and uh, Giovanni Ravindra derived this, this formula. Okay, K is a head wave coefficient. FT is a source function. R is the source receiver distance. And L is what they call the glide distance, which is the distance of travel in the refractor. And generally, uh, we approximate uh, L as R, uh, but nevertheless, I've done corrections using the exact formula. Uh, so N was R squared, R cubed, R the first power, R to the 2.4 and so forth. Gives much the same result. Despite the fact that the, uh, the data was noisy and that with the, uh, the geometric corrections, uh, can amplify the noise, often by 60 odd dB, the, um, the stacking actually uh, gives you quite a reasonable estimate of the head coefficient and improves signal noise ratio quite significantly. Forward and reverse amplitudes can differ. Uh, and I've used that to actually uh, achieve a variety of things, including this elusive optimum x y distance. Does it quite nicely, actually. What I didn't expect is that the source and receiver head wave coefficients are equivalent. Now, for the few people in, the, in, the, uh, in my group here who, want, who know the Zopritz equations, is that the transmission coefficient down is very different from the coefficient going up. Sorry, Peter. But um, so here we have. Uh, an obvious difference between reflection and refraction methods. Um, and this allows me to update the 1D amplitude formula to a 2D, so I have headwork coefficient for source and receiver. And it also makes the source function uh, a constant for a given source setup and receiver setup. And in turn, if we're going to get into full waveform inversion, it simplifies one further factor. The, um, the head wave coefficient is approximate, I've got a P wave approximation, which is approximately the ratio of the acoustic impedances. And it's very similar to the downward going transmission coefficient for strong velocity contrast. So it looks about right. Okay. And as I said, um, for this study, we're looking at a variation of 12 dB, which is a factor of four. So what do you do with these head coefficients? Well, you invert them, okay? So I've got a three layer model. Uh, this is a, a detailed tomogram uh, with uh, iconal tomography. I've got a surface layer of about four meters thick uh, with a velocity of about 400 meters a second. I call it soil. 
right now four meters of soil is a lot of soil and all i can think is that those wheat farmers in warinia are really plowing deep these days the second layer is the weathered layer and velocities vary from about 1800 to 2000 uh, to 1000 meters per second and it's about 60 meters thick bedrock velocities change from 4000 to about 6000 so i've got two increasingly complex models. One is a uniform layer on top of a simple variation in the weathered layer. And the second one is the weathered layer, which is a bit more complex on top of a far more complex uh, bedrock. Now the P-wave approximation, which is uh, this formula over here, third one down, uh, gives a reasonably good approximation of the head wave coefficient. The red is the measured, the blue is the P wave uh, approximation. Now the head wave coefficient is a fairly, a fairly complex animal. Uh, the Zopritz equations were uh, derived by Knox and Zopritz at the end of the 1900s, of the 1800s, they've been around for what, 120 odd, 130 odd years. The head wave coefficient has been a bit more challenging. Uh, Kenya knocked out an expression in 1939. Uh, Helen did something in the early 1950s. Uh, Worth uh, updated the um, uh, uh, Zvolonsky expression. Trevani and Ravindra have got something which I find very difficult to use, but I found actually uh, comparing them uh, with real data, the Worth equation and Trevani and Ravindra are quite similar. Okay, so what I've done is derive an approximation for this top god awful formula, and that's the formula here in red. And what it has is scalar 20. Got the ratio of the acoustic impedances of the top layer to the bottom layer, and it's got the ratio squared of the shear wave velocity in the bottom layer to the compressional wave velocity. There's no sign of the shear wave velocity in the upper layer. So rearrange it and get the, P, uh, the shear wave velocity as the compressional wave velocity scaled by the head wave coefficient and this acoustic pieces and the densities. I put this first estimate into the exact Worth equation and compute a head wave coefficient. I compare that with the measured value and get a difference and in turn get a correction for the shear wave velocity and then repeat it. Okay. We've got to use densities. So I picked up uh, what I feel are representative values for the densities, and I scale them by the P wave velocity to the one quarter power. Um, and this was a result derived by Gardner, Gardner, and Gregory, and is written up in uh, Sheriff and Gelder. My work, and in keeping with Trevani and Ravindra, is that the densities are that pretty cool. Just put in a number that's reasonable and, um, and that's, that's satisfactory. So what do I get? First off, for the weathered layer, the blue, so this is my shear wave velocity in the weathered layer station number. Blue is my first estimate with my approximation. The red is the result after 10 iterations. In general, it works quite well. I've got a couple of places like here in the middle where it's a bit noisy and um, I, think the, I think the square root of negative numbers. I've got a dead trace here, so that's not so hot either. But I haven't smoothed it. I've taken the raw uh, head wave coefficient without smoothing just to see how stable it was. And as you can see, uh, it's remarkably good. The top right hand corner is showing the head coefficient. Uh, the blue is the measured, 
and the red is the computed after 10 iterations, pretty good match. And I've also put in the uh, shear to compressional wave velocities down the bottom. Um, I have concerns, right? They seem to be a bit low for me, but whatever. Did the same for the uh, weather, uh, for the refractor uh, bedrock. Uh, and again, I get pretty good fit between the first estimate and result after 10 iterations. I mean, it's, it's, it's too good to be true, but, but it is true. And I'll put it down to that fantastic estimate that I had first off. Um, a couple of places uh, where there is a dramatic difference and these occur where I've got actually uh, what I believe is major faulty. Again, the head coefficients match up quite nicely as do the uh, shear wave, uh, the shear wave, the P wave um, ratio. Okay, so what I've, what I've done, I've taken the travel time data and computed uh, the seismic velocities in the weathered layer, uh, the soil layer, and the bedrock. I've used those velocities together with the head wave coefficient to generate the shear wave velocities. So compressional bedrock, shear bedrock. Compressional weathering, shear weathering. Compressional soil, shear soil. Okay. So I haven't used any shear wave receivers. I haven't used any shear wave sources. I've just used the amplitudes of the uh, P waves. Uh, I described the, the method I've just uh, mentioned in the uh, Brisbane AEGC uh, conference extended abstract. The rocks on this side and left hand side are the um, uh, Devonian sediments. The rocks on the right hand side are the Ordovician turbinites. What we have is an apparent paradox. P wave velocities systematically increase from about 4,000 to about 6,000. They would suggest that we're looking at increasing rock strength from, you know, from left to right. However, the shear wave velocities uh, increase systematically and then drop. So, paradox. Okay. Um, clearly, the lower shear wave velocities are a result of the turbinites being <coughs> profoundly anisotropic, having a pronounced foliation. And what that does suggests that obviously um, P wave velocities are used routinely for rock strength, but so uh, the shear waves, these days in most geotech, we're using surface waves. But here we have a perhaps a more detailed method of looking at that. Now, I have uh, taught engineers, mining engineers, petroleum engineers, uh, and my youngest son's an engineer. And they want to model everything. They want numbers to model everything. Now, my belief is that the, uh, uh, the time has come to move away from uh, acoustic tomographic inversion the full waveform inversion so I can validate the shear wave velocities. Okay, so the head wave coefficient constitutes the other half of the refracted signal that's been undervalued and neglected for more than half a century. Head wave amplitudes with both low fold and high fold data can be readily uh, processed to generate useful measures of the head wave coefficient. So you're going to do it with 24,000 processes. P wave head wave, the P wave head coefficient can be inverted to generate useful models of the S wave velocities. The question is how long before the geotech people uh, realize that it's possible to get more detailed uh, elastic properties from full waveform elastic inversion. What they need is realistic starting models. 
very uh, computer intensive. Uh, and exhibit A is that we can actually achieve quite uh, quite good estimates suitable for um, more detailed inversion. We should say that um, uh, signed up for a couple of SEG DGS workshops in the Middle East and um, uh, I can recall a gentleman from PDO, a Petroleum Development Organization of Oman, saying that the interpreters uh, wanted full waveform elastic inversion as their final product. So, uh, uh, and he's saying that a typical 3D data set would take 10 days of computer time on the heavy duty computers that they have. So they're prepared to put in the effort to, to do that, to the four wave inversion. And to me, it's a no brainer. It's going to happen with uh, geotech investigations in due course. Now I'll talk a bit about uh, model building. Uh, and this will lead me into uh, the uh, uh, the, met, uh, the, the metallic minerals uh, side of things. Now, I'll quote, I'll read the top line, which is from Menke. The role of model-based inversion is to provide information about the unknown numerical properties which go into the model, not to provide the model itself. So essentially, if you put in a detailed model, you'll get a detailed tomogram. If you put in a low resolution model, you'll get a low resolution tomogram. You can't expect to put in a low resolution starting model and expect to get a detailed result. Now, I was hunting around to find something that was pretty snappy. And I was looking at uh, something like the, uh, the entropy of information theory. And I thought, I've got to be able to get something out of that. Um, but I like the idea of entropy with the arrow of time. And I thought, gee, I can use that as the arrow of resolution. So the, uh, the resolution only goes one way. It goes from de detailed to less detailed. Now, I put this up because current best practice is to use diving wave tomography, which assumes that we have this velocity gradients in our weather layer. This is a 1D uh, diving mode tomogram study model. I've got a, what I call a 1.5D model, which is essentially a modified common reciprocal method. I've got a detailed 2D, which is a GRM. I process them so that the uh, RMS misfit errors stabilize. And it's about five, milli, five milliseconds for all of them. This took 20 iterations, this took five, this took five. Uh, and these actually took about two or three, but, um, and they're essentially smoothing out the gridding artifacts of my, um, of my dreadful gridding process. Uh, and then I process them all the way to 100 iterations. And we can see that they all end up giving much the same, which is absolutely uh, minimal resolution. Now, the problem is that in most seismic refraction sets of data, most of the arrivals are come from the base uh, of the weathering or from the, from the bedrock. A small percentage are the direct arrivals. And they're the arrivals which give us the velocities in the weathered layer and in turn affect our our depth conversion process. Now, the challenge is to parameterize the, uh, the arrivals in the weather layer so we get reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, velocities. The standard approach is you send you know, a file down to the printer down the corridor, get a printout, bring it back, and get stuck into it with a pencil and ruler. And, and, and Pick representative velocities. Now, it's impractical with current sets of data. 
Um, they, I mean, they're pulling out petabytes of data a day with, um, uh, with some of the big reflection operations. And getting lots of paper and pencils and rulers is, is crazy. Now, diving wave tomography overfits the velocity model in the weather. It, it invents layers. And it smooths the velocity model in the uh, sub-weathering because the problem is um, ill-posable. Now, in this case here, I'm going to try and uh, uh, parameterize 24,000 traces. We'll see how I go. So when I first get up into this stuff, I get these huge volumes of data, and I'm thinking, where am I going to start, right? I don't want to print out pages of this stuff. So I, uh, I took a modified reciprocal method, that is forward shot, reverse shot, and receive in the middle. And it's a bit like in, in, in with a standard uh, refraction processing, you would apply this algorithm for every receiver in between. I don't. I apply it to one in the middle. It's a bit like a Vena resistivity depth sounding. You systematically expand the sources at the end, electrodes at the end, so that you systematically look deeper. And initially, you're going to have all these ray paths matching up for the surface layer, and then you're going to get a mismatch, and then they're going to stabilize with a deeper refractor. So what we see that initially, we're picking up arrivals from the top of the weather layer, and it's about, you know, give or take, about 10 milliseconds. And if you look down here, I've got a velocity algorithm as well, giving me a velocity of about 400 meters a second, 400 meters times 10 milliseconds, that's it. Four meters of soil, right? Bit of a problem with what that four meters of soil is composed of. Then eventually, um, all, the, uh, all the planets are aligned and we get the arrivals all coming from the base of the weathering. We can see that most of the arrivals in fact come from that, we can define the base of the weathering quite well. Up here, I've got a problem where we're running into layers getting a bit too close together. And there's also a transition one. I can get a reasonable estimate of the velocity in the weather layer. It's about a thousand meters a second, and it should be up around about 1800. But because of this sort of convergence of these layers, it's a bit, 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 bit unreasonable, a bit hard to pick but I can pick the velocity in the bedrock going from 4,000 to 6,000. Okay, so I've got, I've got a tool, I've got a tool. I can pick my velocities in the bedrock and my time model of the bedrock, you know, with reasonable uh, precision because I have lots and lots of travel times. I don't have a lot in the, um, in the weather layer. Okay, so this is the standard presentation. Travel times uh, uh, plot in the vertical direction. I've plotted every fifth shot here. Uh, so instead of the 24,000, there's about 5,000, sadly. Um, the hardest thing I ever had to do was plot with the time scale going downwards. We think, you know, it's a no-brainer, but 60 years of plotting upwards and have to flick over the other way was, was a bit of a challenge for me, but I did it. I took a deep breath and I did it. Okay, so this is my six-fold path to parameterizing the Varna. Bit of luck, I'll get the next slide. Okay, the obvious thing is that 
separate forward from reverse. Uh, so what I've got is common shock gaps. Uh, these are the shock points and I've labeled them as such. And I've joined up all the travel tones that have the same source, the same, uh, same vibrator point. We see a couple of dodgy, you know, picks over here. Um, and because the travel times don't exceed about 360, 370 milliseconds, the grinning has produced some strange effects down the bottom. And you can see over the other side too, yeah, you know, uh, bad picks, etc. So it's real data. This is this is noisy data. Okay, straightforward. Okay, first change. So what I've done is maintain the travel time in the vertical axis. And I've joined up all the times, give me the black lines, but I've put on top the color image, which is the source to receiver offset. Okay, so each data point has a source, receiver, and a travel time. So what I've done is put the source travel time, and I've subtracted the receiver and the um, uh, and the source location to give me my offset, okay? And we start to see that with the careful selection of color, that, you know, the blue goes to green roughly at the break and, break and slope. Now for the big one. Go all the way. Instead of joining up the travel times, for common shock gappers, I've joined up the travel times for common offsets. Forward, average in the middle, and reverse on the um, on the right hand side. And looking pretty good. I found that just simple averaging, even to just two numbers, two amplitudes, two times, often compensates for a lot of this noise. We can see noisy traces here. Uh, and surface of effect moving through, but the average actually cleans it up quite quite nicely. And this is just a simple uh, uh, two two parameter average. Now, step number four. I've changed the vertical scale from time to offset. So. The spacing here of my contours is five stations, 50 meters. So in 50 meters, five stations, it goes roughly 50 milliseconds. Here, the spacing is much closer. 50, uh, state, uh, 50 meters goes 10 meters, uh, 10 milliseconds. Okay, so milliseconds per distance is slowness. When I turn it round, the contours are showing equal time separation. Up here, 25 milliseconds equals that distance. 25 milliseconds down here equals about uh, 10 stations or 100 meters. So 25 milliseconds into 100 meters gives 4,000 milliseconds. So this is reflecting velocity. Now, as you know, velocity is meters per second, slowness is seconds per meter. So they're much the same animal, except uh, this one tends to give me a picture of the structure. This gives me a picture of the velocity. What do you do? You take a simple gradient operator to it. And what I've done is uh, generate Uniform velocity, about 1,000 meters a second. I've got this uh, high velocity uh, bar here. Uh, it tends to give me, in the, in the bedrock, velocity is from uh, minus a million to plus a million. So I just make it all, all within about 6,000 meters a second. But I have another algorithm which handles that quite successfully. Uh, this dipping event, don't know what it is, it needs more thought. This dipping event here 
uh, it's very suspicious. And this little scab here of low velocity um, material is, um, is a concern to me. So the PS, the resistance, is the next step. I convert it to a depth scale. Why, how do I do that? I have velocity here, 1,000 meters a second, velocity here for about 5,000. And we can see there's a sharp cut up. That is my crossover distance. So we know that there's a formula which relates depth to crossover distance with some square root of velocity term. And here my crossover distance is 15 station intervals. And I worked out that the magic factor is four. So I multiply all these results by a factor of four and it effectively converts um, offset into approximate depth. So what I've got is a model which shows fairly uniform velocities in the weathered layer, a lateral change. I've got something here, which I'm a little bit suspicious about. And I've got a low velocity zone here, which we'll come to very, very shortly. Now the diving wave tomography says, you might think that you've just got two layers, the trouble time graphs, but in effect, there's a lot more that you don't know about. We're going to invent these layers. My parameterization simple formula says, well, no, there's not. There's a simple uh, velocity of 1,000 meters a second, uh, getting up to about 15, 1,800 through here, and the rest of it's fairly high velocity. This, this depth estimate here is approximately uh, the same here with the, with the tomogram uh, and 60 meters, which is validated by the borehole information. I mentioned this low velocity zone through here. The detailed uh, GRM uh, inversion shows a low velocity here at station 1600. Uh, so, well, maybe I might believe that. Uh, but this was totally unexpected. This is current best practice. Uh, it, it's, it's just, it isn't uh, low resolution, it's just incorrect. Uh, if, if you go with the borehole data, which says the depth of uh, bedrock is 60 meters, it's about 200 meters through here. Uh, it's giving you a velocity of 3000 meters per second. The, the travel time data suggests that, you know, something else. So what do you do? You say, well, there's some sort of transition layer, rubbish. Or you say, well, because I have these velocities, maybe bedrock is down here somewhere. Um, so we've spent two decades to, uh, doing essentially uh, confirmation bias, which we know is what answer do you want? Um, and there's some quite egregious examples. I quote one uh, in the opinion piece where they were, they did this with um, a nuclear waste uh, disposal site in Sweden. And they did exactly that. And you think for, a, when they had borehole data, a diving wave tomogram and uh, they put a shot record into the publication and you can see that it just didn't match up. Okay, now I'm going to move on to the second part about the mineral system. And uh, this will actually start to bring some of that previous two, two sections together. I put up this Mount Bulger data, which was the subject of a fairly testy little discussion between me and Bob Whiteley some time ago. Um, now, Still down, Peter. Um, now, I put up for two reasons. The first reason is that it highlights the fact that um, uh, metallic mineralization is often associated with, with faults and shear zone. And Mount Bolga uh, demonstrates that. Uh, secondly, that metallic sulfides have high density, and as a result, because of this formula, 
they have no velocities. And the final thing is that, um, did you drill these holes in, in Aquitaine? Yeah, yeah, okay. And you can see that we've got one, two, three, and a bit four holes, which show a mineralization down to 240 meters. And it validates the fact that we have a vertical structure, okay? A vertical geological structure. Diving wave tomography turns it into a horizontal structure with no indication of the either the fault or the mineralization. I did a number of things in that little discussion piece with Whiteley, and this is one of them. And you can pick up the shear zone and the mineralization uh, with you know with simple refraction processing. You can drop the light back again with 200 uh, iterations. And again, convert vertical structure into horizontal structure. Um, so you can see I've got a thing about diving wave tomography. And I hammer it because this is current best practice. And we're looking at mineralization, which is nominally, we're looking at uh, uh, these flower structures, the fault zones and so forth. And so I think my tomography just isn't going to uh, cut the mustard. Now, uh, Terry Harvey started a discussion on seismic exploration for mineral deposits. And uh, John Hughes put in his five cents word. And I got sucked in and I wrote an opinion piece for preview. And uh, it was uh, it was knocked back. The uh, the three um, the three reviewers, all seismic people, knocked it back. But I had to get some idea of what mineral systems are all about. Okay, so mineral systems. I'll read it out because because this is a bit above my salary grade. Mineral systems describe the genetic relationship between a source rock and accumulation. The simplest form: a mineral system can be described as a fluid source, a migration pathway and a trapping mechanism. Migration pathways are needed to focus the fluids from their source into the trap. Uh, mineral deposits lie on adjacent to major fault zones, suggesting a causal relationship. Okay, now, most of the seismic application to mineral systems has been looking at migration pathways, looking for flower structures, etc. cetera. Um, and what I've been doing is wondering about this trapping mechanism. Uh, Campbell McQuaig uh, has done a fair bit of work on this, and I've plagiarized some of the pictures from his um, PowerPoint presentation, uh, which can be obtained from the uh, ob obtained online. Okay, so what we have is some primary fluid source here fluid reservoir, we have some sort of uh, transport mechanism here, we have a fluid sink, okay? Uh, the picture on the top right is by, um, uh, I can't think of a name, but the lady from, uh, from Geoscience Australia, will come to me shortly. Uh, this is another, um, and it is, this seems to me to be this picture should be turned over on its side. Uh, this is a picture from Silito, which I can relate to, showing some sort of igneous intrusion, um, migration pathway, and some sort of uh, patio surface and some sort of trapping mechanism. Uh, is it Leslie, uh, Leslie Wideborn? Is, 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 yeah. yeah. is that the name? Yeah, this is one of her images. Uh, this is one by Campbell McQuaid, and I like it, right? Because, because it shows the things that I can relate to. So it's got a couple of faults like so. It's got nice red arrows showing fluids moving up, and it's got stuff dribbling out the surface onto the sea floor. Now, for my very limited knowledge of um, mineral uh, deposits, I'm thinking, is that a black smoker? Is he, is he showing 
the black smokers that we've seen in all the graphic uh, underwater you know, images, mid-Atlantic mid Ridge stuff um, off the north of PNG, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what we have is north down here somewhere, a migration pathway and some sort of trapping mechanism. This is the Lockwood profile. Uh, this is the 40 meter data. And for the uh, section in the middle is showing uh, dipping events there, the Harvey group, there is fluvial sequence. Uh, not often you see nice continuous reflectors like this in hard rock uh, seismic. This speculative stuff over here, we're very familiar to um, the stuff as volcanics, right? These are the nasty things you don't like to see in a sedimentary uh, sequence. So this is a Carroll volcanic sequence from here. Devonian sediments. And the part that interests me is this dome-shaped event here. And I thought, does that look like a felsic intrusion? Does that look like something is sort of pushing its way up? So that's my primary source of heat and maybe fluids. What you don't see is the mast and thrust. Now the mast and thrust is a major structural feature. It's just been there for over 100 kilometers. Uh, and you say, well, if you can't find the mast and thrust in the seismic, well, maybe you should think about what you're doing. Okay. So I did my, um, my thing with the uh, with the uh, uh, my 1.5D common reciprocal thing uh, method, and I've got a time model which is showing the time about 50 milliseconds down to 200 milliseconds uh, to the bedrock. It's showing quite a dramatic change, showing uh, quite unusual break in the in the um, in the interface and what I found was looking at events in the forward direction versus the reverse direction they didn't follow the same ray path they would follow different layers down into the bedrock middle image is showing one of my common oh uh, sorry one of my full waveform uh, refraction images and it's showing a uh, bit of faulting through here. Okay, this is the, uh, the Harvey group, the fluvial sequence, and some of these things come up quite nicely. Also generated a uh, detailed refraction tomogram showing low velocities here associated with uh, this drop off in the depth of bedrock. And I'm saying, well, maybe that, that is my uh, mass and thrust. I've got Another quite dramatic uh, de uh, decrease in velocity, copying again another shear. And over here is the, um, is the Carroll Volcanics. Now, I should say that the Ordovician Volcanics have been particularly prospective uh, up and down the Lachlan Toll Belt for mineralization. The uh, one hand diving wave tomography doesn't really help you much. You can probably say that these bumps here and here correspond with these low velocity in here. But again, we've got a major structural feature, mass and thrust. There's no sign of it in the um, uh, in this stacked uh, common midpoint reflection section. I've been quite uh, absorbed with the with the ramp anticline and um, uh, this is my time my uh, quick and dirty method of looking at the time model you see the ramp anticline here break which corresponds with this break here another little offset here which corresponds with that slight problem with with offsets but um, sort that out and again uh, this is showing uh, this low velocity which i think is related to the um, Mass and thrust. Right. So I took the refraction travel times. This is the standard presentation 
travel times in the vertical sense. Uh, this is what 300 stations, which is 12 kilometres. I represented it in terms of offset. We've been there before. I did a rough and ready velocity estimate. Uh, I've got the first first two or three traces have been gapped out because the vibrator mover. Uh, so I don't have travel times there. And I probably didn't pick them, if the truth be known. So I converted it to depth. So what I've got in the left-hand picture is the 12 kilometres uh, of the seismic profile. It shows roughly 150 metres of tertiary alluvium. The red here corresponds with the uh, Ordovician volcanics, the Cowell volcanics. I've got a low velocity zone here, not well determined, but still I'm forgetting uh, low velocities. The yellow is the Harvey group, fluvial sediments. I get a low velocity zone through here, which corresponds with the Mars and thrust. And I've interpolated those other readings from about 15 meters upwards, uh, just, just, just for cosmetics. I've taken the four kilometers from here and expanded it. So this is the Water Vision Volcanics, Harvey Group, uh, tertiary sediments and low velocity zone through here. What I have is the section here, another scab, huh? and it's if I go on the 2000 meters per second contour, it's about one and a half kilometers by about 75 meters. If I go on the 3000 meter per second uh, contour, it's about 900 meters by about 30 meters. Now, I would have you believe that I have found a relic black smoke. I would have you believe that I have a migration pathway and a trapping mechanism. Huh? It's beside prospective volcanics. I've got down the bottom, I've got an igneous felsic intrusion, which is providing the heat. I believe that this is the best invention since the 10 speed electric toothbrush. Huh? My bet is that you don't share my enthusiasm for it. Huh? So, your task is to give me an alternate geological explanation. If I submit this stuff to a reputable journal and say, I found a bit of smoker. It will take them a fortnight to stop laughing. You people weren't quite so discreet about it. And they'll reject my manuscript as being preposterous. So I want you to tell me what I found. Now, the, the other thing is that all of our processing, our reflection processing, treats the regolith, the weathering as a velocity anomaly, and it removes it. Now, so the task is to find these uh, fracture zones, these flower structures down in the bedrock, and this is a bit harder to find. And my, my uh, 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 suggestion is that we're looking in the wrong place. Maybe we should be looking in the regolith or in and around this area rather than looking below. And the question is, is this a refraction target or a reflection target? Why don't you do some magnetics, PM, and gravity feature? That would make Why doesn't someone else do it? Well, um, <laughs> that would try to boost your case. I just want to get my bloody paper published, right? I don't want to make money or find things. I want to get my paper published. I'm happy with, it. I'm happy with anything, but I need to have a reasonable explanation. And it's now, here's a, a zone of intense clay development, the conductive zone with the quartz. Comp, uh, 
accumulation creating the scab. There'd be no black smoke that would come with the tissue. So, I found a black smoker and I'm sticking with it, right? <laughs> now, obviously, I should look at the adjacent line, L2, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you, you wonder if there's a density effect, you know, maybe detailed density modeling would be. Um, I'd like to see, obviously, as a seismologist, a 3D, 3C, uh, 3D, 3C survey over the area. That ain't going to happen. What I want is you to suggest to me an alternate interpretation. Okay, so so we we're looking at trapping mechanisms, trapping something, whatever it is. You aren't prepared to put your money on sulphide mineralization, but you are prepared to put your money on clay and and silicious deposits, right? Something's coming, so you're prepared to accept that something is coming up through here. Uh, and it might not be gold, uranium, uh, plutonium, or whatever. It might be something as useful as clay and, and silica, perhaps. Okay. What about a question? Why is it gold being covered over here? Because sulfides are uh, high density and they reduce the velocity. That's the weathering side. That could be the velocity, which is what caused the velocity. It's probably less than measured than the sulfur to be there. Say again? Some velocity from sulfur. I mean, I've, I've, I've shot over the, over the Mount Bulger deposit, and I tell you that, you know, from field measurements. And, and uh, I had a formula up a bit earlier, which showed it was the, uh, the, the velocity was the, um, uh, elastic properties divided by the density. And when the densities of sulfides are, what, three? Sometimes four times rocks. Okay, it really, it still reduces the velocity, clear. Okay, now I'll fly through this at warp speed. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll get through it quickly. Okay, so, the, the target for most of the petrol of the um, mineral exploration is so-called flower structures. And there's a paper by uh, Heather Shins on the Escondita mine uh, in Leading Edge last year. Uh, and she's looking for just for that. Now, when we were looking in reflection data in, um, you know, in sedimentary basins, we're looking at offsets in, um, in continuous horizons. Now, there's not a lot of continuous horizons in hard rock environments, with one exception, the base of the weathering, okay? It is a major interface. I've developed a technique, essentially I'm plotting the intercept time, I get a correction, uh, which I call the source receiver uh, offset. Uh, I can get it through cross correlation, which gives me, um, I'll flick for this. Okay, so what I've got here is a shot record, I've got a common midpoint, a common intercept gapper at station 1559. Uh, so there's something like about 80 odd traces here. Forward traces, good signal noise, reverse traces, not so hot. So I stack them up, okay? Do a sort and gather in the stack. This is just a brute stack. Uh, this is a brute stack with um, uh, balance, and this is the stack with decon. Um, and it comes up quite nicely. I've got the black line through there is the travel time uh, measure of the horizon. I do forward, reverse, and combine. Again, you can see that the forward have better signal noise than the reverse. It'll actually pick up a, um, a buried focus, which we can see in the, um, in the shot record as well. Um, Actually gives quite nice theta. I stacked it on the five traces. Uh, traces uh, 110 to 120. So I'm getting uh, six fold here forward, six fold reverse, and 12 fold uh, uh, for all of them. And you know, it shows quite a, uh, it just shows the benefit of stacking. I mean, it's, it's quite spectacular. Now, I've been a bit concerned about 
what this event is through here. And it's a converted wave. I'm convinced it's a converted wave. So now, um, so I, I stacked on, I stacked on sources rather than receivers. And I put in the, um, uh, the first multiple, and here's that event through here. This is a balanced section. Uh, you can see where I've got a gap in the, um, in the vibrator positions. And here I've put AGC, and it comes up quite nicely. Now, it's a converted wave. So it's, it's a, um, a shear wave down, P wave along, and P wave back. And um, I'm trying flattening it. Um, I believe it exists. There's a 12 dB fall off in the head wave amplitude, as we talked about before. There's a 6 dB with critical angle. So there's an 18 dB uh, fall between here and over here. That explains why I can pick it up here, but not back here. That's why I'd like to see those vibrators in line. So what did I do? I went to the, uh, the inline array of the 40 meter data and I generated, um, this is the older stuff. This is 12 kilometers of refraction time model with the RCS, the top one. I flattened it, showing it getting an event through here. So that's a refraction time model. Um, and this is the uh, midpoint stack. Uh, this is a second. This is half a second. We can see that, uh, that the same dipping event occurs. So I stacked it on, uh, I stacked on the source. Now, I don't know uh, what these dipping events are. Maybe there is something there. But what I didn't expect to see is all these breaks, right? in the base of the weathering. And a bit of thought, I'm thinking, am I looking at a flower structure there, no? Fault, 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 and one over here, no? So it's a compressive regime to hold up, no? Things are being squeezed together, and all these highs in the bedrock all these highs in the bedrock, a result of compression, are we looking at flower structures? You want flower structures? I'll find your flower structures, right? I can find lots of them for you. But I mentioned that the previous uh, image showed you flower structures. Can't see the Marsden a fault, it's a major geological structure. So, um, my belief is that this current process of uh, the best practice is to remove the weather layer from the reflection section. It's probably the only reliable continuous interface with which you can see uh, any structure. We're using, you know, uh, 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 the, we're removing the base of the weathering with we're standing corrections, which are based on diving wave tomography. Right, let me try and put it all together. This image is currently best practice. It doesn't give you a good idea of any faulting in the bedrock, okay? Um, for, for the 2D, I can see Velocity changes here, which is which are reflected over here, and they correspond more or less with lots of breaks in the time model for the for the uh, base of the weather. We're looking at our migration pathways, flower structures. Okay, um, but. Also, it doesn't really reflect what's happening in the regolith. Uh, I can find um, little scabs like so associated with the low velocity zone. I can find middle sized scabs associated with the low velocity zone. And I can find much bigger ones, gigantic ones. I don't know what 
uh, uh, what geological process would generate that. My feeling is that to be able to look into this area here, both above the, um, the base of the weather, the base of the weather, we should be thinking about full wave form of active inversion. And these would be at least a starting model for, for achieving that. Uh, do I have some thoughts on statics? Well, this is probably an adequate uh, statics uh, replacement for what I think is a, um, a really flawed technique. Okay, the conclusions. Our society is systematically moving towards uh, uh, taking on the requirements of sustainable de development. And there's been a couple of articles in the leading edge last year. Uh, and what it means is they're looking more at the, uh, at the near surface and the regolith. I got a thing from the SDG today saying that um, they're going to put a new section in geophysics called near surface and urban geophysics, something like that. So, um, so the their society is moving towards uh, greater focus on the regolith. That certainly is uh, the um, area of interest for geotech investigations. And one would hope that that cottage industry one day uh, takes on something a bit more adventurous like elastic inversion. But I think it also applies to our mineral exploration. Uh, we should be looking at perhaps uh, getting more out of the near surface with the existing reflection data, such as that recorded by Geoscience Australia. So my, um, my suggestion is that maybe it could be worthwhile going back to look at some of the GA data to look for cloud structures, suspicious steps in the uh, base of the weather region. Thank you for your attention. Now, What I need is a credible explanation for the for the seismic step. Now, I'm not referring to myself or my critics, right? I'm referring to this this feature here, right? This feature here. What is it? Uh, I don't think so. I, I, no, I don't think it's a scapula. No, no, no. I think it's a. Uh, uh, if we go across, I'm having trouble with this. I'd like it to be red. You said the nicest thing. <coughs> no, I've got this scapula up here. Right? What I've got is two cheap. Quick and dirty techniques. This is a quick and dirty technique. I, you just put it in, and I've got, I think it's a, um, I think I've got it in a MATLAB thing, right? It's, 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 you just chuck it in and spit out a, a histogram. And if you get this scatter of points here, you think, oh, you yeah, know, what is that? Now, this also is another quick and dirty technique, right? It's, it's not any sort of sophisticated processing, but because of its simplicity, it, um, it's, it's very effective. And I, I haven't put it through the, um, uh, the tomography software yet, partly because I can't get the bloody software to work. Um, but I think that they're real rather than scattering. And I think uh, because of the, it shows up in both the cheap and dirty on the top right, and this one here gives it some sort of veracity. I should say that I had a look at this more closely. Oh, dear me. What am I doing that's not? I'm going to next slide. Right, okay. 
So this is from my 2013 paper, and I blew it up and in this, so they're there in the tomography. Huh? Now I didn't I didn't try to to model stuff. You know, I have a uh, um, I, I was more interested in what's happening down here. Right? So I'm more interested in these uh, low velocity zones and trying to track down where the mass and thrust was. This wasn't particular interest, but I went back and um, and there it is. Um, so and this one over here, uh, do I think it's real? Mm, it's associated with the low velocity zone. Okay. This one here as well. And so I'm seeing an association of low velocity shear zones in the bedrock and this occurrence of these scab, scabby things. Right? So, what am I looking at? I'm looking at a, a disbelieving audience. <laughs> Thank Darren for the very interesting presentation. And I'm sure we've got a few discussions that would be 